Hello. Just wanted to check whether you can hear me. So please leave a chat message just for me to be sure. Hello. So, hi and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, this is uh, our first uh, virtual meeting in the Danish Power BI user group meeting. And uh, I'm, uh, this is my first uh, hangout, so please bear with me if there's any technical issues, but I've, uh, I've tried and uh, I'll do my best to make it, make it work. Uh, the main reason why we're doing it live today is that we have managed to get uh, Tristan from the French Power BI user group uh, to present a session about uh, storytelling using Power BI. Uh, Tristan also presented at the Power BI World Tour in Copenhagen and I had the pleasure of meeting him. And he's a very good presenter, so you have something to look forward to there. But uh, the agenda, just, just briefly about me, I'm a response CTO in Catman Solution. Uh, I primarily work with the customers within FMCG, fast moving consumer goods and retail. And I'm the leader of the Danish uh, Power BI user group. And if you have questions uh, or anything else, you can follow me on Twitter and uh, also my blog and send me an email if you have uh, questions. You're more than welcome to do that. 
So the uh, agenda for today is that I'll present some of the Power BI news uh, that we have seen for the last month. Uh, and I'll do a session on how you can move your Power BI desktop files to Asia and Alice services. And then, yeah, Tristan will join us in uh, approximately uh, 45 minutes and present his uh, storytelling session. The presentation files uh, will also be shared. So I have in my Power BI News a lot of links. Uh, so I will post this presentation on, on the meetup so you can download it from there. Otherwise, uh, feel free to reach out uh, on Twitter and I'll send you a copy as well. But uh, in uh, November, we got the uh, new desktop release, and we had a lot of nice uh, features included in that. Uh, we have the uh, rule-based conditional formatting in table and matrix. We now can align uh, the column headers in tables and matrix. Uh, we can also use the selection pane to do uh, visual ordering. And one of the things that I really like is the ability to lock objects on your report. And I'll demonstrate these in, in a while. Uh, the uh, ArcGIS maps were also uh, updated, so now we have a plus subscription. So if you want further uh, functionality in that custom visual, we can uh, subscribe to data, uh, demographic data, uh, and that's has a price of approximately, I think it's $5 per month to use it. We also got some interesting uh, things about uh, report options where we can activate that uh, filters, uh, cross-filtering should, should not be enabled if we're working on uh, slow data sources. And some cost of visuals and uh, some cell level, level formatting on uh, multidimensional uh, cubes, uh, new data connectivity, uh, the Impala connector, I haven't, I haven't actually used it, so, uh, but some of you might use it. And the, the uh, add column from examples also got uh, some improvements. All of this is described in, uh, in this link, uh, so you can follow that and check, but I'll show some of the issues when I'm going through my case later. In the uh, service, we have an update to the on-premise gateway. Uh, you should also always make sure that uh, you use the latest version in order to get all the capabilities that we have in Power BI. We uh, also got a new version of the Power BI report server, so you can run Power BI on-prem. And uh, one of the most Perhaps interesting things is that we now can expand and invite external guest users uh, to our Power BI uh, apps and services so we can actually invite guest users so they can consume our apps. And uh, if they actually have a Power BI Pro license in their own company, they can actually use that when they browse uh, the the data in our Power BI service or tenants. Uh, and I wanted to include a few uh, Power BI tricks, desktop tricks that I've uh, stumbled upon the last uh, month. And uh, I, I'll just show the first one. And that, if you haven't noticed all, already, uh, if you use a slicer, uh, you will sometimes at least get a lot of items in your slicer. And uh, this one, the search button, can actually be activated and then a search field will be active in your slicer. So that makes it very easy to find elements that you want to filter your visuals by. So if you have slices with a lot of items, you should 
definitely activate this search feature on, on your slices. Uh, another nice uh, tool is uh, a, a grid tool. And when we try to align our elements on our reports, we, uh, we have the grid, but uh, a Swedish guy called Frederick here, he has created a tool where we can create a grid so it makes it easier to place our visuals within the, those, those cells we have designed. And it's actually uh, a tool to create a, a picture so you can set up the width and uh, heights and determine how many columns you want in your in your grid and you download that picture and then you can insert that in your uh, in your page so if we have uh, this one i have inserted on as a page background this uh, file it gives me this index sorry this grid uh, and when I place my visuals, it's much easier to place it within the grid. And then we can use the lock feature in order to lock the elements. And now we don't actually accidentally move the elements within the grid. That's a very nice feature that makes it easier to place the elements correctly uh, on our report when we are done and we don't like perhaps the color uh, around the grid yeah we can just remove it and we have uh, the visuals within uh, our report in in place it's still locked so when we activated the lock objects yeah we don't actually move them by accident one of the other elements was that uh, the uh, conditional formatting was enhanced, so we now can add color rules, for instance. So if we go to the values and choose conditional formatting, we can change the background color. If you activate this one, the color by rules, you get the sort of Excel-like feature when you provide a conditional formatting. So if we wanted to create a format for all values between uh, 1 to 500, and another one from 500 to a and that should be all the values in our grid is now colored with, with, the, with the format. Okay. Have a look at those uh, tools and uh, yeah, check out all the news. And of course, also make sure that you have, uh, are using the uh, Power BI desktop from the store. Uh, so you get the updates uh, automatically. There is a few upcoming events that you should be aware of. Of course, uh, we hope and expect a new desktop release in the next week. Uh, and if you haven't signed up already, the SQL Bits in 2018 is running in February. And uh, I guess there will be a lot of Power BI related sessions that could be very interesting to, to follow on, on that. Okay, I'll just check if uh, there are. Nope. Uh, let's move on then to how to move your desktop files to Azure Analysis Service and perhaps even more interesting, why should you consider that? Uh, Azure Analysis Service. What is it actually? It's 
according to the documentation, when you look at that, then it's a um, service that in price that provides you with enterprise grade data modeling capabilities in the cloud. Uh, and you, we can mash up and combine from multiple services, define matrices, et cetera. That uh, can then be consumed in Power BI, Excel, and reporting services, et cetera. But a shorter version is that it's actually Power Pivot or a tabular model running on a server in the cloud, or actually your Power BI desktop file including the, the model and the queries that is stored and running in the cloud. And uh, why should you actually consider using Azure Analysis Services? It, uh, it gives you a dedicated resource for your data model. And you can scale up and down uh, if you have uh, high frequency of queries, you can uh, scale up. And you will also believe when you have a dedicated resource, at least uh, see some increased speed in your queries. You can also back up, use it uh, as a backup, so you can make sure that your data or your models are actually backed up. And we also have the possibility to automate uh, these services so we can turn the servers on and off. Uh, we can also automate uh, how we scale up and down. And uh, that can be done from uh, scheduling uh, using PowerShell, for instance. Uh, and it's, it helps you in uh, using the capabilities and size of your databases very uh, easily, actually. Uh, one of the things that we are missing in maybe Power BI uh, for now is the ability to do incremental load. So when you design a data model and refresh that in your Power BI desktop file, you will always load all the data. Uh, but using Azure Analysis Services, we can actually partition our we see fact tables, and we can uh, do a process of a specific partition. So if you only wanted to update the, uh, the current year uh, of sales, we can do that and do not need to update all of the data. Uh, if you're working uh, cross countries, you might be interested in translating your columns, uh, measures, etc. And that can also be done using Azure Analysis Services. It can also be in a in an on-prem uh, tabular model, of course, but uh, that can be done in using. Uh, Azure Analysis Services as well, because it's the same platform as uh, we're running on-prem. We also have the possibility to put security on objects. So if you have user groups that shouldn't perhaps see uh, some uh, confidential information, we can put uh, security on objects. So if a specific uh, column shouldn't be visible for users or a specific user group, we can hide that uh, using the Azure Analysis Services. Uh, we can also do a thing that uh, I think is missing in the Power BI desktop, and that is the ability to group our measures or dimension elements in folders. And that could be done using uh, the Azure Analysis Services as well. The uh, cons, yeah, uh, when we're moving the data model uh, to the cloud, we will have to pay for that. And that is, uh, of course, an extra cost to uh, Azure. If you then are a heavily user of the increase, decrease uh, functionality that we have uh, I think it was introduced in uh, the October release 
And as we are now connecting uh, di using direct query, that is not yet supported uh, in uh, when we are connecting to Asia Analysis Services. And as we are introducing a server, you might also have some uh, need for a BI developer to know what is <laughs> a tabular model uh, on a server, what can you do, and that might also give us some BI developer costs. So what do we need to, to do this? We need an Asia subscription, and if your company already has a uh, Asia subscription, of course you have to have uh, enough permissions to create servers in the Asia portal. Or you can sign up using uh, your own uh, private email address for a free Asia account and try to test it off. And uh, if there is a web designer, and I'll show that in a while, but if you should when you should design or change your model, you will need to use Visual Studio in order to modify your, your data model uh, and install also the SQL Server data tools in your Visual Studio. Uh, in order to manage and process your Azure Analysis Cube, you should also uh, download the latest version of the SQL Server Management Studio uh, in order to uh, manage your server, including the roles and uh, and also process the the cube. But let's have a look at how uh, this works. So I have uh, created a, a Power BI desktop file, and it's actually very simple. I have three tables. Uh, I have a internet sales, I have a product, and a uh, dimension table for the dates. And this is connected to uh, a local SQL server. That's installed on my machine, and I've then created. Uh, sorry, I'll show this one instead. A very simple data model uh, with our DIM products, our fact internet sales, and our dimension date. And I've also created a uh, fact measure calls amount. That's simply just. Oh, I just need to unlock this. <laughs> so you can see that the lock objects um, works on all elements, and I also have a row count. And so now I want to move this data model to the Azure Analysis Services. So I'll just save this and switch over to the Asia portal. The, uh, the Asia portal has a analysis services tab and we can actually very simple add a, a new server. We'll give it a name, attach it to a subscription, determine the usage group, and we must also here select the pricing tier. And that determines, of course, the price. And when you do testing, you should pick the, uh, the developer. As you can see, that has a, a monthly cost of around uh, 600 Danish kroner. And there are also smaller versions, but each has different query processing units. So that determines how many you can use at the same time and how much uh, memory that is allocated. In this case, we'll just select, uh, I've selected developer and I've already created this uh, server for today. It takes around 
two to three minutes, and then you have a uh, a server in the cloud. So I prepared this one, my test PBI. I'll just close, sorry, uh, this one. And it has a server name, it has a pricing tier, and it also has connection name. And as you can see, there are currently no models on, uh, on the server. So in order to import a Power BI desktop file, we open the web designer. This will then list the different servers we have available, and we have the possibility to add a new model. So when I click the Add Module, I have the possibility to create data from Asia SQL Server, uh, Asia SQL Data Warehouse, or import a Power BI desktop file. I can then browse to my file, I will find it here. And then it will import the PBIX file to the server, the connections and queries uh, as well, and all the data. So depending on how big your Power BI desktop file is, that will, of course, take a matter of time. In this case, it's only about one megabyte large, this file, so it shouldn't take too long. And hopefully, yeah. And to the right, you'll see that now we have the three tables. We have the fact internet sale, the DIM product, and the DIM date. And we could see that we have some measures, the sales amount, for instance, and I can click Run. And I get a the sales amount, and I could add the uh, color, for instance, as well as another one. So now I have color combined with the sales amount. I can use this web designer to model the data as well. And when we switch to that, you will notice that now we suddenly have other tables here. We have local date table, etc. And where did those table come from? The these table is actually created because as a at least as a standard, we have in our desktop the uh, auto date. So when you add a date to your to your visuals, you will see that it automatically creates a date hierarchy. And these tables are actually uh, also present in your data model. And these are created because this check mark is set. So if you don't want these also generated timetables in your, in your model, you should remove those before you export, uh, or rather import your RBI desktop file to the server. Because in when you design the model, you will probably you won't want to have these tables in in your model. And when I tested this, you will also see that. I have one file where I had uh, checked that off, and the uh, the file I'll show you uh, I'll just find it here. 
first I created a file where we have the auto tables in, timetables in, and now in this case I created wow. So there's actually a small difference in the file size. And that will of course vary if you have very if you have many date tables uh, in your model. So think about that when you're creating uh, your models. Let's switch over back to the designer. Uh, and we'll return to the, to the model here. Now I have my, my model on the server. And in, in general, I, I, I really don't like the web designer because it's, 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 uh, it's hard to navigate and it's, uh, it's easier to uh, design this using a Visual Studio project. So download Visual Studio, the community tool, it's free. And you can also download the, uh, the SQL Server data tools and you'll have the capabilities to, to work with the model within Visual Studio. And I'll just save this file. Okay. And I'll just copy this one. And open my Visual Studio. to the desktop and open the file. Oops. That was the wrong one. I'll just Sorry about this. I am. As it's open from an internet source, it will warn me that this is a dangerous file. And also this one, it will warn me when I open the, the model designer file. And this bit file can be uh, compared with your, with your data model within the Power BI desktop file. It looks a little bit different. You might recognize the uh, the design from if you work with Power Pivot. And here we have the tables, and you can see these are the generated tables that was from the auto date feature. And in this case, we'll see the dim date. And because I haven't processed uh, this table, you won't see any data. But the data is actually present uh, on the server, and I can process it locally. So I have a copy of of the the data here. I can ex <clears throat> I can now change uh, my model, so I could uh, switch to the fact internet sale and and create more facts, etc., and save it. All right, yeah, I'll just save it as a solution as well, like this. 
and I, when I should publish my changes, I can deploy my model. Now I need to log on to the server as well. And it will be updated on my server. Now I haven't changed anything, so it won't be. Uh... Yeah. It won't have changed anything. But in the properties of the solution, you'll see that it will publish to this server, which is the server name that is used in order uh, where the uh, model is stored. So when I want to create a report connecting to this server, I can use this connection string. And if we create a new report in, in the Power BI desktop, clicking this one. Now I can select get data and using the more tab, oops, I can connect to Azure, the analysis services database, click connect. This is a preview feature still. I mean the enter the server name and say I want to connect live. This one, I have to enter my credentials. Sign in. This is the server. This is the database, so I can install more models on the server. Click OK. And uh, as you can see, the <clears throat> The elements from the data model is still, and as we are connecting direct now, we won't see the uh, the, uh, the tables view or the relationship view because that information is now stored on the server, right? And we can also see live connection is uh, visible in the in the corner, right hand corner below here, and we could create a visual like this. This can then be published to the to a workspace on your server. This test, and I'll publish it to my workspace. And one thing is to notice that now we as we're connecting here, it will use an enterprise gateway and we can open that, connect. And the report is available in, uh, in my workspace. And uh, I can, of course, also here modify my my report. Let's save this. And uh, the data sets. <clears throat> uh, as it's connecting to what did I call it? I called it test, right? So here we have the data set that is connected to the Asia analysis services as well. Checking the settings, you'll see that this one is connected and we have a schedule refresh. So these will be, be at least the cache will be updated every hour and you can set that even faster. <clears throat> one thing that we also have as a possibility when we use Azure Analysis Services, 
is that we can actually do this refresh of our data model uh, as many times a day as we want to. So we're not limited to a, if we don't have a premium capacity, uh, but only uses the Power BI Pro, I think it's eight times a day on the, uh, on the Asia analysis services, we can do it as many times as we like and use partitioning uh, to do that as well. So just to give you the last uh, tool that we can use is the SQL Server Management Studio that we can use to connect to the uh, Asia analysis services. I can uh, connect to the server using my credentials. And we have the database, the uh, PBI file. We have a, a connection, you'll see two. I think that's because the date tables that they're creating is a Sort of a secret copy, so it actually generates two connections. Uh, we have all our tables, and if you right click on the fact internet sales, that will probably be our biggest sales. We can select to process the table, and we can process the full table. Or if we had set up partitions on this, that was the incremental data load. We can actually now create new partitions where we actually uh, uh, selected to update one or more uh, partitions in our in our queue. Okay. I think that was uh, it. Uh, if you have any questions on the, on the top of your head, you're welcome to uh, type in questions in the in the live chat on on YouTube, and I'll try to answer that. But otherwise, I could see that Tristan was actually uh, joining us, and uh, now he's gone again. <laughs> but uh, let's hope he's joining us. Back now he's there, so I will pass it over to Tristan. So welcome, Tristan, and uh, glad you could uh, join us. So uh, thank you. are you there, Tristan? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, great. Well, thank you very much, Eric, for inviting me. Let me just uh, share my screen to make sure you can see it. So can you guys see my screen? I can see it. Yep. Yeah, Eric, can you, can you confirm that everyone can see my screen? Uh, I can I can see your screen, so everybody should uh, be able to see that. I perhaps should stop okay. mine. Okay, that's great. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, thank you all of you for yeah. So thank you, Eric, very much for inviting yeah. me. I'm really happy to to share my passion with you guys in in Denmark and all over the world. Yeah. So yeah. I think you guys are quite lucky to have. Uh, Eric, as your user group leader, I had the chance to meet him a few months ago in Copenhagen during the world tour. And yeah, he was really helpful. And I think he's doing an amazing job here in, in Copenhagen about Power BI content and so on. So yeah, thank you again, Eric, for inviting me. Thanks, so, Tristan. Um, I have a lot of things, cool things to, to show you tonight, especially three new features that were added to the desktop version of Power BI back in September and October 2017. I'm just going to quickly present myself uh, before we dive into the session. 
So my name is Tristan. I am a Power BI consultant at ASEO, a Microsoft partner in France. So we use Microsoft technologies to solve uh, business problems, I would say. So I'm really focused on uh, Power BI activities, such as consulting, training, and so on. I co-founded the Paris Power BI user group, which is called Club Power BI, in uh, February 2017. So we basically organize monthly meetups in Paris about any topics related to Power BI. So Power Query, DAX, data visualization, apps and flow, which will both be the topics of our next meetup uh, next week. So we have something like 600 members, more or less. So we're quite happy to see the French community growing that fast. And uh, yeah, so whenever you come to Paris, just feel free to join us. We also have a YouTube channel, so you can follow us from yeah other countries. But unfortunately, as you may know, French people are not that good in English. So most of our content, or no, by the way, all our, of our content is in English. But uh, yeah, <laughs> if you speak French, then it will be it will be good for you to have uh, such a good content. Uh, equally, feel free to follow me on Twitter. I'm quite active on the social networks. I share a lot of things around, obviously, Power BI, but also data visualization, Microsoft technologies, and so on. So yeah, I will be more than happy to have a chat with you on Twitter. The three things I want to show you tonight are a drill through, which was added in uh, September 2017, explain the increase, again, September 2017, and the very famous bookmarks. So to showcase these three features, I'm gonna use uh, some Power BI dashboards I built myself uh, a few a few months ago, actually a year ago, um, about topics that I really like, which are soccer and politics. So the I will showcase the drill through and expand increase on my Power BI dashboard on the football player Lionel Messi. So here you have it on the on the screen. So this is basically a, a dashboard I built on Lionel Messi last year. So I have a few pages. Uh, the first one is like the, the, the cover page. The second one is kind of a global page where you can have like very high level statistics about the player. For example, the number of goals, games, assists that you can slice by competitions, results, and also year, like football year and so on. Okay, and what I really want to do is to go into the detailed page, which is basically this one. So it gives me a little bit more information, uh, some, yeah, about the statistics, such as how does he score, uh, when, during the game, what was the t status of the game, when, so on. So what I really want to do is to go from the very high level statistics to the more granular data. And to do so, Microsoft introduced the drill through features in September 2017. So for example, you can use this graph where you can see the goals per competition to drill through the detailed page. Okay, so I will probably use this one on the Champions League. I want to really go on detailed on the detailed page and really focus on the Champions League. So here I'm going to detailed and you can see well I should have made sure this is a bit more large, larger. Yeah. So here you can see the detailed statistics of Lionel Messi only on the Champions League competition, right? So and I could reach this page thanks to this drill through feature. So how does this work? I mean, internally, there is this new segment here called drill through fi filter. So I'm using a field which comes from my data model, obviously, from the competition table. And I'm using this same field here as the axis of my global page. And this really allows me to navigate through the pages and really adjust the grain of my analysis. So yeah, that was the first thing I wanted to show you. 
I think it really motivates people to build Power BI reports like like a fun funnel, you know. So you go from the very high level facts, and then you can adjust your analysis, drill through, and then drill down to the more detailed statistics. So that's that's it for the drill through. The second thing I wanted to introduce you is probably something you you have already used. It's called explain the increase or the decrease. So let me show you that. I'm going to create a brand new page where I will actually see my the goals scored by uh, Lionel Messi by year. So I'm going to select the relevant fields. OK. So these are the goals scored by Lionel Messi year by year. And as you can see here, in 2012, so it's I'm only focusing on the th four most important competitions, which are Champions League, Liga, Copa America, and World Cup. So during 2012, he scored 72 goals, which is much more than 2000. 11 where, where he only scored 43 goals so i could use all the features of power bi to try to interpret this variance and to build some dashboards and find some insights to kind of explain this increase but from september 2017 i can simply right click and say explain the increase so before i click i'm just going to explain to you how it works Basically, we have a smart in engine, which is going to scan your data model. OK, so only your data model, nothing, nothing apart from your data model. It will only scan the data, which is part of the data model of your PBIX. And it's going to try to find some explanations, some correlations, some facts that could actually explain what has driven the increase of 2012 and you're gonna see it's pretty pretty quick and pretty amazing so i'm just gonna click and as you can see in a matter of not even a second just managed to find some insights insights about the data so here i have this small screen where i can see a kind of a dynamic text explaining the increase so apparently there is a 67% increase of the goals between 2011 and 2012. And now it's going to try to find the more detailed explanations. So you can ha find some insights. Some of them are not that relevant. So I can simply say, OK, this is not really useful. Um, I would say this insight is not important. And it's going to basically help Microsoft adjust and improve the algorithm running behind the screen which is basically i guess some kind of advanced analytics and machine learning stuff and i can simply go and try to find some cool insights for example this one is actually pretty good i can see that from 2012 uh, 2011 sorry in 2012 i can see that spring and wi winter season kind of yeah they truly drove the, the increase in terms of the number of goals. So that's pretty amazing because I didn't have to code anything. I didn't have to even write some DAX. The explain the increase feature is just scanning the model and trying to interpret the insight. So for this time, I can simply say, this is a great insight. Thank you. Kind of smart assistant. There are some pretty cool insights as well. For example, I can see from this one, that apparently Messi was much more performant in Liga in 2012 rather than 2011. So pretty, pretty good as well. The, the last thing which is really interesting is that, OK, now I have this insight, but I would like to be able to use it in my report, right? Because here I have it on a, on a small screen. So I can simply click on this button, OK? And it will basically kind of bring bring in the visualization built by the engine 
to my to my desktop version. So I'm just gonna click on this, and now I have my visual, which is actually now part of my report. I could have built it myself, but actually this is the new waterfall chart, which is pretty amazing. And um, uh, by the way, sorry, let's just me quickly show. Uh, trying to find something because apparently you can't see my screen. Okay, there you can see it. Okay, sorry. So uh, I was just unsure that if you could see my screen from now, but apparently it's okay. So this is the new visual I just bring brought in from the from the engine. As I was saying. You could have actually built it yourself by using the new waterfall chart, but probably you would not have found that kind of insight, and probably it would have taken you much more time than the engine. So pretty amazing stuff, and obviously because it's part of your report, you can now use it to filter your data. You keep the, the interaction between the graphs. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, some people see it as a gadget. It's not that relevant in a business context, but trust me, I'm sure this will be more and more used. Obviously, it assumes that your data model is, is pretty clean, because as I said, the engine is scanning the data model. So if your data model is poor or not complete, then I'm pretty sure that the engine won't find some cool insights. The other thing I wanted to mention about this new feature is the fact that you can actually optimize it and optimize the scans of this uh, smart assistant. How? Simply by hiding the fields that you don't want the engine to scan. So this is obviously very important and really relevant when you are building a data model. You can actually, and this is a best practice, hide the foreign keys of your fact tables and also all the keys that will be useless in terms of the report side. So equally now you can also use this feature to optimize the engine because the engine simply won't scan and try to explain the, the increase if the fields are hidden. So that's pretty good to know. It also optimizes, I guess, the Q&A in Power BI service. <clears throat> So that's it for this uh, second feature. I'm sure you will use it in your, uh, on your side in, with your business issues. I showed it to a client a few weeks ago and he was really amazed. Like the, the engine really found some, some really cool insights, interesting things that my client pr probably wouldn't have figured out. So that's, yeah, interesting. Okay, so now I can just close this file and I'm going to showcase the oopsie, the third feature I wanted to show you tonight is called the bookmarks. So bookmarks were introduced in October 2017 release and it's basically kind of a PowerPoint embedded into Power BI Desktop and Power BI Service. So you can basically register, like save some views of your reports, trying to hide or unhide some parts of your reports, and then save this as a proper slide, like you would do it in PowerPoint probably. And then you can simply use these built-in slides to go through your uh, PBIX file or to your reports and really trying to tell a story about the data. So I'm not going to show you how you can build bookmarks, just to let you know that it's here on the view pane. You have these new features that are called bookmarks pane and the selection pane. So this is how you can build some bookmarks and to kind of to show you the different aspects of the bookmarks. I wanted to showcase this feature on a Power BI dashboard I built last year 
about the US presidential election. And it will give you kind of a complete vision and different use cases that leverages uh, bookmarks. So just uh, a quick uh, notice about this presentation. I'm not here to criticize anyone or to uh, yeah, to criticize some politicians or, or, or anyone. I'm just here to, 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 to show how you can actually tell a story with Power BI, okay? So this presentation is about, as I said, the presidential election. The first thing I wanted to show you about the bookmarks is that you can actually link them to images. So here I have a small image. If I control click on the image, it actually drives me to another page of the report where I have quite some summarized information about how the US presidential election system works. So as you may know, it's an indirect democracy where people, US citizens don't directly vote for the president, but they vote for people that we call electoral college. And this electoral college actually chooses the president. So there are currently 538 electoral votes in the US. So people who are divided into the different states of the of the US. And to become the president of the United States, you need to win 270 of them. So you need to have the absolute majority of these electoral votes. And how do you get these electoral votes simply by winning by being the first in in the states where you are competing and this is called the principle of the winner takes it all it means that when a candidate wins in a given state and when i say wins i'm talking about the citizens vote so if there are more people more u.s citizens voting for a candidate, then this candidate, no matter what is his margin regarding to his competitor, then this candidate will actually get all the electoral votes from the state. Okay, so this is how the US presidential election works. And this is why sometimes you can end up with pretty weird results, because a candidate can win the what we call popular votes, like actually the votes coming from the citizens, but lose the elections because of the electoral votes, right? Because there is no proportionality in the how the votes are, are distributed. So I'm going to showcase this today and try to explain if there is not something weird here in this system. So the third bookmark, I'm just keeping my story. I actually built a map with Power BI with a different states and the results by candidate. So in blue, it's Hillary Clinton. In red, it's Donald Trump, okay? And as you can see here, uh, we have the different results. I'm just gonna keep going. So here I, I'm using the spotlight feature to show the fact that Hillary Clinton actually won the popular votes, the citizens' votes. To do so, you just need to click on this button, spotlight, okay? So she actually won the popular votes, but she lost the electoral votes, the, the votes coming from the electoral college, okay? So this is, the, this is the point. And you can also notice that the turnout was pretty low, like 56%, 57%. I found this pretty low. If I compare to France, for example, we had our elections in May 2017, where Emmanuel Macron was uh, elected. And we had something like, I don't know, maybe 80% or 85% of turnout, both for a first round, round and second round. And we have on average like 70, 80% turnout for each, uh, for every election. So I was quite surprised to see this figure, but apparently it, it was the case um, for the other elections in the US as well. So pretty low, but still. So I keep going. As you may know, 
there are three types of states in the US, uh, states that are called traditionally Republican or traditionally Democrats. So these are the states that have a very stable behavior in terms of votes, in terms of political votes. No matter what is the candidate, they vote more or less always for the same party. So these are called the traditional Republican or traditional Democrat um, states. And there is a third type of state, which, which are called the swing states. And these are the most important states because in a given election, they can really switch and change their behavior, change their votes. So the, these are much more unstable. And these usually drive the results of the election because they represent quite a big number of electoral votes. And the, the candidates really know that the election will take place in these swing states because they clearly influence the end result. So if we try to analyze how Trump actually won, we can see that Donald Trump actually consolidated his, his base because all the states that are traditionally Republican, that is to say they have voted for the Republican Party uh, over the last 25 years, more or less. Well, Trump won all of them, 180 electoral votes. So that's pretty good. He also won most of the electoral votes coming from the swing states. So these are the famous states that are making a real influence on the results, as I said. We noticed that there was a stronger turnout on these swing states. And then he also managed, that was quite surprising, to win some electoral votes in the parties which were used to actually voting for Democrats. So that's pretty, pretty surprising, right? So as you can see here, I could save some views, save some filters on my report and then actually use them as different bookmarks. So this is pretty, pretty interesting. Let's keep going. You can also use the bookmarks and some toggle here where I'm playing with images to switch between, uh, to switch between graphs on the same page. So for example, here, I, I'm using this image to change the graph within the same page of my report, right? So to do so, just gonna quickly show you this. I'm just playing with these new panes, the bookmarks and the images, the different fields that are in my selection pane, right? And by clicking on the image here, I'm simply hiding or unhiding some elements of the different bookmarks, right? And I linked each of the image, both of these are images, I linked them to the relevant bookmark, right? So this is how I build this kind of stuff. You can see some pretty cool videos online, especially on the Gynocube channel and other, uh, I would say, Power BI influencers to show you how you can build this in detail, right? So again, pretty, pretty cool stuff. The other thing I wanted to showcase is the fact that you can actually zoom, use the zoom in your bookmarks. So here I'm actually zooming on the second graph I'm using on the on this page. So I try to find some correlations between the poverty rate and the percentage of uh, Hillary Clinton votes, right? So in X axis, we have the poverty rate in the United States. In Y axis, we have the percentage of Hillary Clinton during the election. So all the states which are above the line, the blue line, sorry, are states that elected uh, Hillary Clinton. And those who are below the line are actually states who voted for Donald Trump, okay? So as you can see here, uh, there, is, yeah, it's, there is a huge contrast. I tried to use uh, the trend line here to find if there was a correlation between the poverty rate and so on. As you can see, it's a downing trend. That means that the more people are 
poor, uh, the more they are voting for Donald Trump, apparently. But this trend is not really relevant because, as you can see, the different points here. And you can also find the classification I used on the map. That is to say, traditionally Democrats, traditionally Republicans, and the very famous swing states, right? So that was just to showcase the fact that you can use the zoom in your bookmarks. Let's keep going. I have uh, eight other bookmarks to show you. So we have this. Now I wanted to go into more details. I really wanted to understand what happened, what drove these results. So I decided to focus on three key states that changed their, beha their behavior from 2012 to 2016. So these are the three states I wanted to focus on. Florida, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. As you can see here, the data is at the county level, so the grain is much smaller. You can actually click and keep the interactions. Yeah, this is something I forgot to mention. The, the, the really cool thing about bookmark is the fact that you can register some views and so on, but the reader of your report keeps the interaction, right? So if I click on the on the on the county here, you actually keep the interaction going. So this is why it's kind of a PowerPoint embedded into Power BI, but it's much more than that because the interaction keeps going. Okay, so I was as I was saying, the data is at the county level, right? Uh, so these are three states that voted for Obama in 2012. I learned some pretty cool stuff with Power BI, thanks to Power BI. For example, the Michigan. I was quite <laughs> surprised by how it was administ administratively built, uh, as you can see here. Um, let's keep going. So as I was saying, these states voted for Obama in 2012. But in 2016, they just switched. And they, in majority of them, I mean, all of them, voted for Trump in 2016. And you clearly see the winner takes it all in action. For example, Florida, there were 9 million voters, more or less. Trump had a very short a margin, only 100, more or less, citizen votes. But because of the system, he could get all the 29 electoral votes. Even worse, Michigan, there were 4.5 million voters. Donald Trump won by very short majority again, only yeah, 11,000 citizens margin but he could get the 16 electoral votes from Michigan. So as you can see, we can ask ourselves some questions about how this system works and how you can end up with this kind of results. Okay, so the, the last thing I wanted to, to show you, I'm gonna end the presentation with, uh, with these uh, last two bookmarks. L let's put aside the fact that in a given state, there is the winner takes it all in action. I wanted to, I asked myself another question about this system because we could criticize the fact that there is no proportion in how the electoral votes are allocated in a given state. So let's put aside this. And I wanted to understand or analyze something else. I asked myself, but the electoral votes are they at least logical? I mean, do they follow, do they represent a similar number of citizens? So in other words, does an electoral vote in Florida represent the more or less the same proportion of US citizens than an electoral vote in uh, Wyoming, for example, okay? So I simply 
divided. I took the number of people who were allowed to vote in a given state, and I simply divided them by the number of electoral votes representing them. So this is a ratio that I built just here. Citizens represented by one electoral vote, okay? And as you can see, I was quite amazed, quite surprised, not amazed, but <laughs> surprised, obviously, that the, the variance between the states are pretty big, okay? So, for example, here, you can see that an electoral vote in Florida represents 500, uh, 500,000 people, right? Whereas in the Wyoming, an electoral vote represents 143 people. So that's pretty, pretty surprising. I mean, yes, obviously, if you take that number and if you divide it by the number of people they are in, in this state, then the proportions are more or less similar. But still, I mean, they are part of the same country. They should be represented more or less on the same proportion, no? So I took ju just to hear the, the same graph, just with a top five and bottom five. So you can actually see the big dis discrepancies in terms of uh, citizens' uh, representativity from the electoral votes. Pretty, pretty surprising, isn't it? So uh, I think I could show you with uh, this dashboard the different use cases of the bookmarks. Obviously, if we get back to this uh, system, it has some political and historical re uh, reasons. And I'm sure there are some people who find it logical. I was just trying to show you here how you can use Power BI, storytelling, bookmarks, to actually tell a story, analyze the data, and makes it easy for your readers, for the readers of your reports, to find some insights, to consume the report, and in a business context, take some decisions. So yeah, that's it for my presentation. I'm just gonna check if there are some questions in the in the YouTube uh, the YouTube side. I I have a question. Have a question for you. Yes. How many how many report pages do you actually have? Uh, as you can see here, I have. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, there is one I'm not using, but yeah, let's say five. Yeah. Or six, yeah, six. So 22 see, views of six reports. Yeah, and I could have actually optimized uh, this because as I said, I built this report last year. So there, there, there weren't the, the bookmarks no. Uh, and I just adapted this dashboard, this report, and I tried. Ju I just plugged in uh, the bookmarks, but probably I would have built it differently if uh, if there was the bookmarks uh, last year. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions about my presentation and the different features uh, I just showed you? No. Oh, I think that uh, it was very interesting to see and a very good uh, showcase both uh, uh, Lionel Messi and, uh, and well, not Bush, but Hillary and uh, Trump. Uh, yeah. So uh, thank you very much for taking the time to present that. Yeah, I was I was really happy to to share this with you and uh, yeah, and uh, I think that. Uh, We'll uh, stop for today and say uh, thank you very much for all the people that uh, attended. And uh, please let us know if uh, uh, on the YouTube channel if you uh, liked it. And uh, yes, give us some feedback so we can yeah. improve. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to yeah comment and uh, get give us suggestions on how we can uh, yeah improve. So thank again, you, uh, thank you very much to be part yeah. of your uh, of your uh, meeting, and hope to meet some of you guys uh, one day. <laughs>
Well, I'm sure that uh, we can manage that. Uh, hopefully, we'll get the Power BI World Tour pass uh, across Copenhagen again. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope to see you there at least. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you very much, Joel, and uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Have a nice evening.